I'm back in my home country to explore one of Italy's best kept secrets. This is stunning Adriatic coast. I'm on a 700 mile journey exploring the extraordinary sights and flavors. Mamma mia! It's very delicious. Mmm, wonderful! Of the magnificent east coast of Italy and its beautiful crystal clear waters. From magical Venice in the north to the most southern point of the Adriatic. Welcome to my Italian coastal escape. I've traveled almost 400 miles down the east coast and the natural beauty of the Adriatic is spectacular. I'm now more than halfway along my journey and I'm visiting somewhere unlike anywhere else on the Adriatic, Gargano National Park. Gargano is the area that forms the unmistakable spur of Italy's hill. This 30,000-acre mountain range has protected national park status. These forests and olive groves are home to some of the oldest trees in Europe. Most of its pastures are used for grazing podolica cows. This farm, 15 miles from the coast, produces a local speciality, cacio cavallo cheese, that dates back to 500 BC. Ah, Giuseppe's family have been making it here by hand for 400 years. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Ah, smells amazing. Mm. Smooth. You get the saltiness, and there is a taste of smokiness. Sembra un po' affumicato. Come mai? Perché nell'ambiente di lavorazione si accende il fuoco, il fuoco per scaldare il latte, per scaldare l'acqua, e quindi indirettamente. Ah, see, that is a natural thing because when they heat up the milk and the water as you making the cheese, there will always be a fire in the corner going, and that gives that smokiness. So it's a natural smokiness to the cheese. Oh, it's a buonissimo. Certo. <laughs> Once you make the cheese, then you have to hang it. The minimum is two months. But you can actually hang it for many, many years. The more it hangs, the more flavor will develop. It's a peccato because it diventa come dire, un formaggio da meditazione. Ah, so he was explaining that this is the ideal cheese for melting. I got an idea for this cheese. Giuseppe has a herd of 100 rare podolica cows. Their unique diet of wild herbs gives the cacio cavallo its distinctive flavor. After milking, master cheesemaker Voltei separates the curds. He pours over hot, salty water and, as he pulls and stretches, the flavor starts to develop. It's almost 40 degrees outside and there is a fire in this tiny room. Let's see if I can handle the heat. Well, I have to say, when I woke up this morning, one thing that uh, I didn't think I was going to do is stretching cheese. Okay, we can do that. Oh, nice and relaxing. Cheese making. Sempre piano piano metto in acqua. Sempre in acqua. Okay, so he said keep the moisture of the water so then it stretches easier. Yeah. Then he said, put your hands in cold water, otherwise you get burned. A bit too late now. Lungare, sempre lungare. Ok. E quindi la devi, sì. la devi filare. Sì, Quante volte lo devi fare? Fine più sottile, più, più meglio. meglio. He said that the more you stretch it, and the better the flavor of the cheese is going to be. This is a dying art. Just half a dozen local farms still make cheese this way. It requires physical strength, patience, and a good, firm grip. 
E quanti ne fai al giorno? Ma poco, tre. Prima fanno quattro, due, tre, sì. quattro. Sempre, Solo? Sempre questo. He only makes between three and four cacio cavallo a day, so you can imagine how special this cheese is. Senza rovinare. So this is the end cacio cavallo. This is the end product. Now it's going to go straight into salamoia, which is uh, salt and water together. So there you go. This cheese looks like a huge... This special cheese deserves a special recipe. I'm thinking one of Italy's most famous dishes. I'm going to show you a really cool vegetarian dish, melanzane alla parmigiana, which is baked aubergine alla parmigiana. And this, once you taste it, you will not miss meat at all. Cut the aubergines into centimeter thick slices. And then, put salt on top. If you have a beautiful sunny day, just leave them in the sunshine for about an hour. And what's happening, all the moisture is going to come out and they're going to be nice and dry, ready to be fried. Now, the first thing that you have to prepare once you've done the aubergine is to make the tomato sauce. I'm not going to put any garlic, I'm not going to put any onion, I'm not going to do anything like that. I want the aubergine to be the queen of this dish. Tomatoes, I'm not going to use fresh tomato because to make a good Italian sauce, you should never use fresh tomatoes. It's got far too much water. I'm using tinned chopped tomatoes. I'm using about four straight into the pan with oil. In there, basil. Very important to use fresh basil. That goes in there. Salt, very important. And a little touch of black pepper. That's it, really. Cook for 25 minutes and the job is done. Oh, yes. This is perfect. All the water is out of the tomatoes. Now, just put it on the side and leave it to rest. Now, let me show you exactly what we're going to do to cook the aubergine. We're going to use half and half. Half vegetable oil, half olive oil. Olive oil tends to burn quite faster. So vegetable oil helps the oil not to burn. Half goes in there, and we're going to shallow fry, eh? I have one dish with plain flour and one with beaten eggs to coat the aubergine. Now, if you look at the aubergine, all these little drops of water, get a kitchen cloth, pat them down so you take all the excess water away. Then, get the aubergine into the flour. Now, slap the aubergine so any flour, any excess flour goes away into the egg. So, coating and slapping, coating and slapping. Lift them up, make sure all the runny hair comes out, straight into the oil. Let's see, you probably want to cook this on a for one and a half minutes to two minutes on each side. Look at the color. Beautiful, golden. You know that they're going to be nice and crispy. Oh, yes. I remember when my mommy used to make the melanzana la parmigiana, the smell of the frying aubergine used to go all over the house. And for me, I was kind of salivating from 7 o'clock in the morning until lunchtime to have this aubergine. I've repeated the process for 30 slices. Now, time to layer. So let's start. Aubergine on the bottom. See, that's what I want you to do. Cover the bottom completely, slightly overlapping the aubergine. Now, once you've done that, I'm going to put a little bit of the tomato sauce, not too much, just dot it around the aubergine. This is how many people, they make a mistake when they do the parmigiana. They put far too much tomato sauce. Then in goes the almighty cacio cavallo. Now, if you don't have the cacio cavallo, you can use mozzarella, any cheese that is going to give you that kind of stringy uh, texture. Now we go with the basil, OK? A little pinch of salt, parmigiano reggiano. And then we do it again. One for the parmigiana, one for Gino. It goes in the oven uncovered for 20 minutes at 180 degrees. Now, once you take it out of the oven, it's very important you let it rest for a good 15 minutes before you serve it. Aubergine alla parmigiana should be served warm, never hot, because this is how you get the best flavor out of the aubergine. 
Oh, è pronta, eh? Beccatevi sta parmigiana, guarda qua, guarda. Bellissima, che spettacolo, eh? spettacolo. Oh, che ne dite? It's very good. <ride> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sì? Bene. The perfect melanzana is that you can see the layer with every ingredient in it. E io veramente spero che ho dato giustizia al cacio cavallo. I just told Giuseppe, I hope I did justice to his cacio cavallo. So, buon appetito. Grazie. Salute, salute. Ah. You're too yeah. young to drink. So, no, salute. Very good. It's good, eh? Oh, piano. They devour the parmigian. Look at them. <laughs> I've left the mountain ranges of Gargano behind and returned to the Adriatic coast. My next stop, 120 miles south, is the extraordinary town of Polignano a Mare. This shining gem sits on limestone cliffs above glittering waters and I'd say is one of the most famous spots on this coast. Now, this place 20 years ago was almost derelict. Now, it's one of the most beautiful towns on the Adriatic coast. Once a poor agricultural region, Tourism has changed its fortunes. Now its enchanting narrow streets, rustic charm and incredible views draw over 85,000 visitors each year. What is incredible about this town that it's actually been built on the caves and I've never seen that before. Polignano a mare means to be at sea and this town literally looks like it's floating almost 30 meters above the sea caves. Ice cream time! Ciao, bello! Tutto a posto? Certo! Allora, ascolta, un bel gelato. Polignano's gelateria regularly win the most prestigious ice cream competitions in Italy impossible to come around here and not having an ice cream. And my favorite flavor, nocciola, which is hazelnuts, I like stracciatella, and panna, which is whipped cream on top. Bello. Prima. Grazie, grazie. Volare. This town is also celebrated as the birthplace of the father of Italian singers. If you come to Polignano, you're gonna have to meet my friend, Domenico Modugno. In 1958, he wrote and sang what is perhaps Italy's most famous song, Volare. But it's not a singer, caves or ice cream that brings the really big crowds here. This is the oldest house in town. Doesn't really look anything special from the outside, but apparently, Something special going on inside. Antonio? Ciao Gino. Buongiorno. Come Posso? stai? Vieni, vieni, accomodati. Ecco. Ah. Vieni Gino, vieni. Qui stiamo entrando nella parte... Antonio grew up here with his parents and grandparents. So this house is over a thousand years old. It used to be a tower, uh, so in the old days they can look out for pirates or anyone who wants to invade uh, the town. But I've seen Roman defense towers before, and it's not the age of this house that makes it so special. Wow! Huh? Che vista! Now, this is a view. Polignano's unique position so far above the sea has made the town a magnet for cliff divers. Adrenaline junkies jump from the balconies and cliff tops into the waters below, including Antonio's father and his friend, volare composer Domenico Modugno. Antonio was saying that his dad and Domenico Modugno, they used to come here when they used to be young uh, boys and jump from the cliffs. And he believes the inspiration of writing volare, volare in English means flying, 
it comes from the fact that they used to see these crazy people flying from the cliff straight into the sea. And that's how the song came about. There you go. And three years ago, this little house became host to the biggest cliff diving competition in the world. Each September, huge crowds gather to watch elite divers compete for the world title. Leaping from platforms 27 meters high, built from Antonio's balconies. And to get to the platforms, the divers actually walk through Antonio's home. Where we are at the moment is about 15 meters of height, but this is the lowest part of the house because you then can go all the way to the top, which is over 25 meters, where these crazy guys, they jump in the sea for over 25 meters. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I would definitely not do that. I'm definitely not ready for that height. But maybe I could give the lower 11-meter cliff I go on the other side of the cove. I'm going to take the opportunity to say thank you to everybody. Hopefully, I'm going to see you very soon. If not, it's been a pleasure. to do it. Now I worked up an appetite, I'm going to create my version of Stracotto, a local one-pot lamb stew. But not just the average lamb stew. My lamb stew has got celery, it's got black olives, orange zest, honey, fresh thyme, caramelized onion, red wine. It's got everything to make this the best stew ever. Now, the first thing we're going to have to look after is the onions. Slowly caramelize finely sliced red onion. Now, once they start to caramelize like this, which they are, they look amazing and it smells divine. Let's talk about the lamb. You can use Lego lamb, uh, you can use Neko lamb. You cannot use filet lamb or any part of the lamb that is too tender. Size, look, big chunks. Straight away inside with the onions. So you probably want to do this for a good five minutes before you start to add any other ingredients. So as the lamb is cooking, celery. I love when I buy celery with the leaves. Often people, they throw away the leaves. I'm going to use this at the end just to give an extra kick. Big chunks, OK? So like that. Celery goes in. Then I'm going to start to use thyme and bay leaf. Now, let me tell you something about bay leaf. This is a quite tough herb. What you want to do is this, look, in your hands and bruise it. So you, you want it to really squish it. And the smell and the flavor is all going to be released in there. So bay leaves goes in, thyme, just shake it like that. Then orange zest. The flavor of the orange with the lamb, it just works beautifully. Let's start with the zest first. Don't throw away the orange because we're going to use the juice of the orange as well later on. Make sure that, see, all this zest in the back of your grater, just straight in there. Now, olives. Please make sure that they're pitted because someone will break their teeth. Now, once everything is in, honey. Honey and lamb, you can never go wrong, trust me. Guys, I wish you could smell this. OK, now it's time to add the one. The one that I've chose for this recipe is called uh, Tormaresca. Now, this is a, a local wine from Puglia, from the region of Puglia. Uh, it's got a quite spicy uh, flavor to it. OK, there is a rule 
when you cook with wine or any other alcohol. Make sure that the first liquid that you add into your food is always the alcohol. Because as it goes in, okay, what you can see very clearly, it starts to bubble away and it tells me that the alcohol is evaporating, but the flavor stays in the pot. Next, add 10 tomatoes, squeeze in the orange juice, stir, cover, and simmer for half an hour. Funny thing is that people around Polignano, they tend to eat more meat than fish, which is quite strange, being on the Adriatic coast. But because of the rockery cliff, in the old days, it was very difficult for fishing boats to uh, come to the coast, so they, they kind of tended to have more meat than fish. Still looking good. Okay. Now, remember it takes an hour and a half to cook my lamb stew. So we do the first half an hour without the potato, and now is the time to add in the potatoes. Make sure you use a, a waxy potato. I don't want a floury potato because a floury potato is gonna break into the stew. I want a potato that can take another hour of cooking. So straight in there. After another hour of bubbling away, it's time for my final ingredients. First, add peas. Frozen or fresh will work. Then, do you remember the leaves from the celery? Just roughly chop them, a good handful. And this is gonna give color and flavors. Stir all together. Another 15 minutes, the job is done. While the stew simmers, rub raw garlic on toasted bread to accompany. So, nice rustic plates. Let's see. Look at that. Little garlic bread. Everything you need in life, right here in one bowl.